So it's uh, five o'clock, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started um, as I have a lot that I want to cover today. Um, but first, following up on the, um, uh, the presentation right before mine, uh, my name is Joseph and I uh, got involved with uh, GNU Linux uh, maybe about 10 years ago and have been um, very enthusiastic about free software uh, since then. Um, I was first introduced during my studies in uh, experimental linguistics um, uh, using uh, Linux for um, corpus linguistics um, and analyzing language in that way. Um, but today I'm going to talk about something very different. I'm going to talk about um, energy consumption uh, in software um, and how to eco-certify your software. Um, this is part of a project uh, called KDE Eco, uh, which is comprised of two separate projects, which I'll talk about during the talk. Um, before we get started, there will be a lot of links and references in um, the talk. If you would like, uh, you're welcome to um, download the slides at our GitLab repository. Uh, it's uh, invent.kde.org slash teams slash eco slash BE for FOSS. Um, and um, there you will get links to many of the uh, sources that I'm referencing today. Um, just so you know, similar to uh, the talk this morning uh, from Matthew Miller, Miller I'm, I'm very distracted by chat and uh, um, other kinds of uh, things happening on the screen. So I'm gonna close the chat for now and hopefully we'll have time and I'll open them back up at the end um, so I can um, answer any questions and engage with the Fedora community. So some background um, before we get started. Um, there's a report from the Association, uh, Association for Computing Machinery uh, in October 2021, um, which uh, estimates that the ICT sector um, contributes about 1.8 to 2.8 percent of the global greenhouse gas emissions. This number includes everything from uh, um, desktop software to uh, internet uh, services um, and servers to data centers and uh, blockchain uh, proof of work uh, systems and things like this. Um, to put that into perspective, a, uh, the global aviation industry um, is estimated to contribute about 2.5%. So we're more or less in the same uh, general area. Um, what's contributing to this? Um, so many people think about dig digitization as being a way to reduce CO2, right? Instead of traveling by airplane to a conference uh, uh, where we can all get together, now we are meeting online and uh, therefore saving um, a, uh, a lot of uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but in the past uh, 10 years, there's been an explosion uh, in the ICT sector. For example, the uh, area of artificial intelligence um, increased by 300,000 times the energy consumption between 2012 and 2018, and now is doubling every few months, according to the report. Um, and the number of internet connected devices is protect, pr predicted to increase five fold um, between 2015 and 2025, um, where there will be over 75 billion inter internet connected devices. And on the trend that we're on now, if this continues, uh, the report estimates by 2050, uh, the ICT sector will contribute about one third of all global greenhouse gas emissions. Let's take a look at the distribution of what's contributing to the energy consumption uh, in the uh, ICT sector. So this is a graph, this doesn't include certain things. This is from the SHIFT uh, project, which is a French nonprofit, um, which is looking to um, uh, move away from fossil fuels. Um, this does not include uh, blockchain technology. It does not include transportation uh, energy consumption. It also doesn't uh, include uh, end of life treatment. Um, the graph is sort of broken up into two parts. On the top right, you see the uh, energy consumption for production. And on the bottom left, you see the energy consumption for usage. And um, the production accounts, uh, according to this uh, data, this is from 2017, so it may be a little different today, but it gives the general uh, idea. Uh, accounts for 45% of the energy consumption um, in, in a digital technology, and usage uh, accounts for 55%. Now, in my talk today, I'm going to uh, talk about things that are relevant for the production 
energy consumption, as well as the usage, uh, what they're referring to as terminals. Um, so any of the devices that we use. I have nothing to say about data centers. I have nothing to say about uh, uh, networks. I might reference something, but but it's not the point of the talk. Um, and I have nothing to say about blockchain technology to, to put some uh, boundaries on what we're going to talk about today. And the main takeaway message uh, that I have today is that the two pillars of free and open source software, that is transparency and user autonomy, already put free and open source software at the forefront of sustainable software design. And it's not me, just me, that's saying that. Um, the Blue Angel um, Eco Label, which is the official eco label of the German government, um, also recognizes the values of transparency and user autonomy as being crucial for a sustainable digital future. Um, I'm going to talk um, first about energy uh, in a few different ways uh, in terms of energy efficiency, energy conservation, and energy um, uh, sources. Um, and then I'm going to talk at the end of the, of the talk today about the Blue Angel Eco Label and how to eco certify your software. So first, energy, different uh, aspects of energy consumption that I'll talk about. So energy efficiency. By efficiency, I'm referring to um, uh, doing the same task, uh, but requiring uh, less from the hardware that you're doing it on. So the result is the same, but the uh, uh, energy consumed is uh, uh, decreased. Energy conservation um, is uh, about eliminating unnecessary processes, which are going to drive up energy consumption. And energy sources, I'm going to specifically talk about maximizing renewable energy sources. So let's uh, look at energy efficiency. This is from a report from the German Environment Agency, um, which is comparing different uh, uh, computer programs doing the exact same thing. I'm going to focus today on the two far left bar plots. Uh, these, this is a comparison of um, word processors. So word processor one in light green and word processor two in dark blue. Um, again, doing the exact same thing, word processor one consumes four times the energy compared to word processor two, right? So, so this might not make a big difference for one individual user. Um, but you have to think about it at scale. And to illustrate that, I'm going to take a back of the envelope calculation from an online course, um, uh, Sustainable Programming uh, at SAP um, from Detlof Toms, um, to, to look at how the uh, numbers quickly add up. So let's imagine what the yearly savings would be for one worker when eliminating just one CPU second from a process. One CPU second uh, is about uh, 10 watt seconds in uh, energy consumption. And uh, reducing by one CPU second means you reduce each transaction by about 10 watt seconds. If there are 20 such transactions a day over a uh, working year of 230, day, 230 days, uh, that adds up to a 46,000 watt second savings. Now that in and itself is not much. That's roughly the equivalent of a 50 watt light bulb, which is on for 15 minutes. But now let's multiply that out, for example, to the EU. The EU has about 500 million people in it. Um, if 2% of that 500 million use GNU Linux, which is roughly the uh, market share of Linux, um, and one fourth of that 2% uses, for example, the PDF reader Ocular, um, we're talking about 2.5 million users. And that one CPU second reduction will result in 32 megawatt hour savings in the EU. Um, to put that into perspective, that's roughly the equivalent of driving 180,000 kilometers in a modern electric vehicle. Um, that would be the equivalent uh, as driving from Paris to Beijing 11 times back and forth. Right? So these are non-trivial numbers. Now, if we can think about, um, if I can convince 300 Fedora developers and other free software communities to achieve just 10 of those optimizations, right? we're talking about 96,000 megawatt hour savings. That's roughly the equivalent of the power consumption in a year of 30,000 two-person households. So the numbers add up very quickly. Now let's think about energy conservation and the processes that are running when we're using a 
um, a computer program. So again, this is from the German Environment Agency comparing two text editors, the same two text editors from before. Um, but now we're including the uh, information over time um, of what's, how much energy is being consumed um, at which uh, point in time. I'm gonna focus now on everything after that red line. That red line is the point when both text editors, again, they're doing the exact same thing, um, save the document that they're working on and then go idle. You can see in the bottom uh, plot that the text editor, in fact, goes idle. Um, in the uh, upper plot, the text editor continues to uh, do various tasks. Uh, the question is, what is happening here? Um, is it telemetry? Is it phoning home? Um, is it necessary for the functionality of a text editor? Can users disable these extra processes that are happening? Okay, that's the first part of energy cons conservation I'm gonna talk about. The second one is software-driven hardware obsolescence. So some of you may have friends or family that have seen the warning that this device doesn't meet minimum system requirements, or this device is no longer supported, even though they may have bought the hardware just five years ago. Um, the result of, of uh, these uh, software-driven hardware obsolescence is that you have new devices that are produced and shipped unnecessarily and functioning devices end up in landfills as e-waste. Um, to, to put this in terms of uh, numbers about energy consumption, this is from Apple's uh, um, environmental report on the iPhone 7. Um, this graph is taken from a book, uh, Smart Green World. Um, and you can see that the iPhone 7 um, uh, in its lifetime will contribute about 56 kilograms of CO2. And 78% uh, of that comes from production, 1% comes from the end of life treatment, and 3% comes from transport. Only 18% is in the use, right? So, so software driven hardware obsolescence is a huge waste when it comes to um, uh, energy consumption and uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And some of you may know the statue uh, in England, the Waste Electrical and Electronic Equipment statue. Um, this is a statue that is seven meters tall and weighs about 3.3 tons. It's a representative of the electronic equipment thrown away by the average UK citizen in their lifetime. And the last area I wanna talk about is energy sources. Uh, this is a abstraction of a, um, energy supply uh, in terms of renewable energy. On the y-axis, you have how much renewable energy is available. And on the um, x-axis, you have the time of day. And what you can see here is there's a base level of uh, energy supplied to the power grid from renewable energy. Um, uh, sorry, from re exactly from re renewable, e renewable energy. But at certain times of day, you have an increase where you have more renewable energy that's um, 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 feeding the grid. Okay. So now let's get to what does it have to do with free and open source software? So free and open source software is uh, inherently socially oriented, right? So Matthew Miller today at the um, one of the first talks um, described, uh, you know, Fedora as wanting to make a better world for everybody. Um, you know, free software empowers users and communities to do so. Um, how does it do that? Well, the open development process uh, means that both users and developers have an influence and users can, can become developers and contribute to that process. Um, users can contribute bug reports or feature requests so that developers can develop what society wants and needs, not just what companies want. And this empowerment means that we are empowered to find new and creative ways to improve software sustainability for this and future generations. So let's go back to the three different areas I want to talk about today. Um, first, looking at the bar plots for the text editors in terms of how much energy they consumed when doing the exact same thing. So uh, measuring uh, the energy consumption and making it transparent is the first step towards making our software more sustainable. Um, at the minimum, it means users can make informed choices about which software they want to use. Um, a better outcome is when developers are aware of um, what is contributing to the energy consumption of their software. They can then drive the energy consumption down, making their software more efficient. Now, um, you know, growing up, we had the saying, think global, act local. Well, with software, you can uh, act local and act global, 
right? So this uh, back of the envelope calculation to get from one CPU second to uh, the annual power consumption of 30,000 two-person households, if you, if you think about that at a global scale, right, that was just for the EU. If we multiply that by 16 times, we're talking about roughly the power, annual power consumption of a city like Liverpool, right? And by making the energy consumption transparent, we can um, push other software developers and other companies to do the same. Um, uh, just to reference what we're doing at KDE, um, we've started labeling uh, merge requests and bugs uh, in terms of the efficiency tag. Um, here you see a screenshot. It's, it's quite uh, difficult to see on the screen, um, but this is a screenshot from uh, uh, bug reports uh, labeled efficiency, and this includes things like um, high CPU usage, uh, when softwares freeze or hang, uh, when things slow down, um, all of this contributing to a higher uh, energy consumption. Um, and uh, our first uh, merge request at KDE labeled efficiency was in November 2021. Um, we've had 120 efficiency uh, merge requests since then, and hopefully many more uh, in the future, and want to encourage other free software communities to do something similar. Looking at energy conservation. Um, so again, these are the two text editors over time. Um, and the focus is on everything after the red line. Um, the question is, uh, once we know that the software is uh, um, contributing to these extra tasks when it should go idle, with free and open source software, we can take a look at the code and see what it's doing. Proprietary software, you don't have that option, right? And um, we can design our software so that users have the option to opt out. Let's imagine this is telemetry, which can be useful as some of the discussion earlier um, uh, was about. You know, it's helpful to have statistics and numbers about what's, what our users are doing with the software. Um, but if uh, we should give users the option of being able to say um, they want to turn it off um, also for uh, ecological reasons. So they're consuming less energy. And if we turn it off by default, it's not only good for privacy reasons, um, but it also means that you're not going to have a, uh, a millions of users contributing to higher energy consumption. Um, so, so yeah, uh, we are empowered to make these choices so that we can make our software more efficient. In terms of energy conservation, um, FOSS gives users a real choice to continue using their software. Again, this was already talked about earlier today about support for older hardware. Um, I, I don't know about you, but I know I use hardware and I have used hardware um, for much of the past 10 years that is no longer supported by the uh, producers. Um, I've introduced uh, GNU Linux to family and friends because they wanted to continue using up-to-date uh, operating systems, but they were no longer able to using the software they're using previously. And as a result, what this means is that functioning devices remain in use and new devices are not produced and shipped unnecessarily. And this can have a huge impact on the energy consumption over the lifetime of that device. Uh, again, thinking back to the iPhone, um, over 80% was just in the production, transportation, and end-of-life treatment. And we can demand more, right? This is for the EU, but uh, this can be a global push um, that the right to repair must include software. The Free Software Foundation Europe has an open letter to legislators in the EU published in uh, April, um, demanding that users have the right to freely choose operating systems and software running on their devices. And we can do more. Again, this is from a Free Software Foundation Europe uh, initiative um, called Upcycling Android, in which they're trying to uh, keep smartphones uh, um, up to date with free software um, so that the device doesn't end up as e-waste. Uh, of course, there are there's a long tradition of install events for GNU Linux. Um, we can keep devices in use so they don't end up as e-waste. And by doing so, we can shrink this Wii statue, sorry, my, my graphic design skills are not very good. I just made it much smaller. Um, and we can conserve the shared resources that we have uh, in our society. And the final point is uh, regarding uh, renewable energy sources. Um, again, looking at the, pl uh, the plot of uh, at what times of day is there more uh, renewable energy um, supply. Um, if we can shift tasks that are shiftable, so if for example, updates to times of day when it's maximizing renewable sources, we are contributing less to the greenhouse 
uh, gas emissions of the uh, technology. Um, this is a project actually that uh, just very recently, uh, together with the Green Web Foundation and KDE Eco, um, we're looking at how to uh, um, get information from the grid. This is a, the web, uh, Green Web Foundation has been looking at this, um, uh, packaging something that can then uh, uh, check uh, what the power supply mix looks like at a certain uh, time of day, and then uh, recommend uh, doing updates or other shiftable tasks at those times. Um, if you're interested in the topic, we want to write a uh, proposal to get funding to develop this for free software distributions. So please be in touch. Um, my email will be at the end of the, the presentation. So now let's get to the end of the talk, um, the Blue Angel uh, Award Criteria for Desktop Software, which was released in 2020. Um, they recognize in the uh, award criteria that transparency and user autonomy are crucial to sustainability. We'll look at the three main categories in just a second. The award criteria were the main motivation for the KDE Eco projects, the Free and Open Source Energy Efficiency Project, and the Blauer Angle for FOSS, for which I'm the project and community manager. So the ABCs are the award criteria. Um, so the Blue Angel uh, is the um, official eco-label of the German government. It's the oldest eco-label in the world since 1978. Um, and it's an eco-label that looks at the entire life cycle of a product. Um, the um, ABCs, uh, the three main categories, are potential hardware operating life. That is, does the software, and this is specific for desktop software, run on hardware that's at least five years old? Um, and do users have choices uh, about how the software runs in order to influence the energy consumption? That is, can they install or uninstall software? Can they only install what they need? Um, is there transparency about in the uh, APIs? And uh, are they able to then choose different software products with the data formats that are used? Um, uh, is there continuous support? Can they use the software offline and without um, advertising? Um, these are the criteria that free and open source is already fulfilling in most cases, right? This is what I'm calling the false advantage. Um, you don't need to be free and open source software to fulfill these uh, criteria, but uh, we take it as given that users have autonomy in their um, software usage. Um, the, what we need to do in the, in the free software community to be eco-certified with the Blue Angel is to uh, make our uh, consumption demands transparent. And that's gonna be the last couple of minutes of my talk. So there are three steps uh, to eco-certification, um, measure your software, analyze the results, and then certify. Um, how do you measure? This is a, a, an example of the lab setup. Um, here you have a, a computer on the far left of the graph, um, system under test. This is the hardware that you use to test uh, the application you want to um, look at the energy consumption of. That's connected to a power meter, and you're collecting then the data on a separate computer that you then do the analysis with. We are currently setting up a lab um, in Berlin at uh, KDAB Berlin, who have been very generous to offer space in their offices. Um, we've had two sprints. This is the first one from the 21st of May. Um, and this is the second one from uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, it's still a work in progress, uh, although we do have the setup there. We're working on the tooling um, so that we can automate the process as much as uh, possible. Um, what do you measure when you measure the software? Um, you measure the baseline. Uh, consumption, the idle mode consumption, and standard usage scenario. The baseline is just the operating system went on. Idle mode is when the software is uh, running, but nothing is, is happening. And the standard usage scenario is when you represent what a typical usage of that software would be um, in order to get an idea of how much energy it consumes. All of this has to be transparent and published. Uh, once you have the data, um, you uh, can take uh, the results and use a tool like OSCAR, the Open Source Software Consumption Analysis in R tool, which is developed by the Umwelt Campus Birkenfeld or the Environmental Campus uh, Birkenfeld. Um, and this requires uh, three things, the log file of the actions taken in your standard usage scenario and idle mode, um, your energy consumption data, as well as your hardware performance results, uh, such as CPU usage, uh, RAM usage, et cetera, which you can collect using a tool, a free software tool called Collectal. Once you feed that into the program, you get a report back. It looks something like this. Um, this is for Kmail uh, email client from KDE. Um, here you have, you see 31 repetitions of the standard usage scenario. Um, and you can see there are spikes in the energy consumption um, at, at certain points in time. Um, that's, for example, when sending an email with an attachment, right, which is going to require more processes. For certification, you need documentation of the um, uh, categories uh, hardware operating life and user autonomy. 
And then you need to publish uh, and submit your uh, consumption demands um, in resource and energy efficiency. I'm gonna wrap up now in the next 20 seconds. I just wanted to say KDE is very proud that we are the first ever, um, the first, uh, uh, we have the first ever eco-certified computer program with Ocular. Um, we were eco-certified by, by the Blue Angel in February. Um, and um, uh, this is a very exciting thing for us. Um, we would love, uh, so this is under the KDE umbrella, but the Free and Open Source Energy Efficiency Pro Project and the Blau Angle for FOSS are for all free software communities. This topic is much bigger than any one distribution in any one community. Will you join us? Um, the conversation has already uh, been started in Fedora. I know that there are other initiatives uh, for environmental justice, um, but Andy Arts has just start, started a discussion um, um, at the discourse. Um, link here. And um, if you would like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is to go to our website, eco.kde.org. Um, and you will then see a button, get involved. It has all of the information that you see here. Um, and uh, again, the slides are available. I'll return to this in just a second. And I, I want to just add that the project, Blau Angle Foss, is funded by the German Environment Agency and the Federal Min Ministry for the Environment, uh, Nature, Conservation, Nuclear safe Safety, and Consumer Protection. So thank you very much. I'm going to open the chat now, and I hope that uh, um, I can answer some questions in the remaining time. Um, unfortunately, I will have to leave punctually at, eight, at 6.30 uh, German time since I have a train to catch. So thank you very much. Um, if there are questions, so I'm looking at the chat um, and I'll start. So thank you for the, the positive responses and we would love, um, this really is a topic that uh, this, this is for all of us and it's for, for future generations. So if you're interested, please get in touch with us. Um, start your own projects in Fedora and your own communities. Let's collaborate. Um, let's uh, join forces to make this, um, make free software really the most sustainable software. So I'm browse, I'm going through the chat um, now to see if there are any questions. So there's a comment here about uh, browsers getting faster and websites getting more complex. Um, there's a term for this. This is the rebound effect. Um, and it's, it's a real issue that once you have efficiency um, gains, um, often then usage uh, will then uh, uh, erase any of the gains that you get. Um, and this is a social issue, not a technological issue. Right? And this is also part of what KDE Eco wants to um, develop is a culture around sustainability. It's not just a technological issue. So there's a question about if uh, including crypto mining. Um, the first two plots that I had, which I can return to now, um, one did, the numbers did include uh, crypto mining. That was the um, Association for Computing Machinery. It's 1.8, 2.8% uh, uh, includes crypto mining. Um, the second plot here does not. Um, this only, this does not include transportation production as well as things like proof of work. I would love to continue the conversation with anyone who is uh, watching. Um, please be in touch. Uh, please um, uh, 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 join the conversation um, within Fedora, and um, and let's let's uh, collaborate and uh, make make this a reality. All right. Then I think if there are no more questions. I will return to the uh, page with a link to the slides. You're welcome to um, download and uh, please be in touch. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, uh, everyone, for this great conference and um, enjoy the next few days.